All right, so I'm gonna pair up my snakes for the second time for the breeding season. I paired them up about a month ago, and a lot of people have been asking, how do I pair up my snakes? How long should I keep the males with the females, and how long should I keep rotating them through the females? And I keep changing every year. I change it a little bit every year. As a matter of fact, the first year when I first started in ball pythons, I would pretty much keep the males and females together for three or four days, and then I would separate them for usually three or four days. I'd feed them, and then I give them a few days off and then I cycle them back through the rotation. So I was always cycling the males through the females, separate a little bit, feed the males and then the females and then kind of cycle through again. And I found that it's not only a lot of work to cycle the males through the females for about five months, that you really don't need to pair up that often and it kind of works to your disadvantage. And really what you want to do is you want to separate for a little bit longer so you can really beef up those females. You want to really increase the food, especially right before the breeding season, right at the beginning of the breeding season, seems like a lot of the females really feed aggressively right before they start developing eggs. And really you want to really almost power feed your females because they get to the point in the breeding season where they start developing the eggs within the snake and they go off of food sometimes for six months or more. I've actually had snakes go off of food for six to eight months, sometimes even even over a year you know once they start developing the eggs and they go off of food and then sometimes after they lay eggs they won't go back on food for several months and you really want to prepare for that season of fast so essentially what I've been doing is I kind of changed my my whole system of pairing up my males and females the very first year I'd, I'd pair up for a few days give a few days break and then put them back together and I found out you only really need to pair them up pretty much once every several weeks to pretty much once a month. So last year what I actually did is I would pair them up and then uh, I'd pair them up for like three or four days and then I would give them two or three weeks off before I paired them up again. And I found that it, while it worked pretty well, it seemed like the, the egg laying season was really stretched out over uh, several months. I think it was like four or five months that was really stretched out. So what I did this year, I changed it again a little bit different. So this year what I did is I paired up all my snakes for about a week and a half and I let them stay together for a week and a half, the males and the females. And it was kind of interesting because at the end of the week and a half, when I started separating a lot of these snakes, I found that some were actually still copulating. Maybe they were a little bit slow at the beginning and then just with a little extra time that they had to spend with the, the, you know, the males and the females together, they actually had a chance to copulate right at the beginning of the season. So I'm kind of expecting that my egg laying season will be a little more condensed hopefully this year we'll have more of the eggs all laid within a shorter period of time and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through and I'm going to kind of show you some of the snakes I have. I have two big reticulated pythons that are pretty much my only snakes other than ball pythons that are not ball pythons. And really I bought my retics to pretty much use up all the retired rats from my rodent breeding operation. And, and I decided to actually have two of them and to, to kind of dabble in breeding my dwarf and super dwarf reticulated pythons. And I'm going to take Sunny out. Sunny weighs about 40 pounds. He is a purple albino reticulated python. And then I'm gonna pair him up with Lucy. Lucy is about 90 pounds. She is a white albino, 50% uh, Jampea dwarf. And Sunny is uh, part super dwarf, part dwarf, and only like 12.5% mainland. Still 40 pounds, still a respectable snake. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring you along for the ride and I'm gonna show you how I move some of these snakes. I'm gonna start with my big retic, Sunny. He's always a handful. And it's not because he's really heavy, it's because because he is really long and it just seems he's like really long and lanky. Every time I pull him out, it's kind of uncoordinated trying to deal with such a long snake and I don't really trust him 100%. He used to snap at me when he was a little young snake and he still doesn't have complete trust. I, I haven't really handled him a whole lot and I just kind of handle him just enough to move him back and forth through the breeding season. But the advantage is, is he's been off of food for a while so I think I'll be pretty safe handling him without him jumping out of the tub or anything like that. So let's jump in and move some snakes. 
All right, so I actually keep this retic in a boa tub here in my rack. And a couple things I would suggest is getting a really long snake hook to open that up because if they're in a feeding mode, they can jump out and get a really long reach on you. You gotta really be careful with these retics. Another thing is you definitely don't wanna have any rings or watches or anything like that. I found it really kinda hinders working with retics. So essentially what I do is I open this with a hook just at the beginning to kind of see what Moody is in. And I usually, well, I can, I pretty much know what, well, I don't know, <laughs> he's almost got his head moving a little bit like he might be in feeding mode. He's been on a, a long fast. It's funny, when I first started pairing him up, he started really pounding the rats and then he just pretty much stopped. So he hasn't really been eating any rats at all. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of tease him just a little bit with this hook just to kind of see what kind of mood he's in. He looks like he's in a pretty good mood. I want to get him in a handling mode where I definitely don't want to take a bite from this guy. He's bucking me a little bit. He's not very happy. I just kind of want to go really slow with him. I don't want to really freak him out. He's Sometimes he gets defensive and then he pretty much goes back and forth between being defensive and going on kind of like in a running mode, which I don't want either. So I just want to go really slow, get him up into more of a handling mode. Now he's doing pretty good. I'm gonna hand off the camera here to my assistant. <laughs> Let's see if I can actually get this guy out without too much of a trouble here. And I definitely, Wanna go slow with this guy. He's just so awkward because he's so long and lanky. <sighs> the problem is, is he kind of gets ahead of me. <laughs> and then he wants to back up like this. All right, buddy. <laughs> oh, and he's not really that big. He's just so long, super long and lanky. Oh. Oh, <laughs> all right, he's getting away from me now. All right, all right, let's try this again. <laughs> all right, easier said than done. Whew. This guy's just kind of going crazy. All right, buddy, you ready to come out? The hard thing is he's got so much power and so much reach. You, didn't, you wouldn't think he'd be that awkward until you actually pick up a big snake like this that's not really that friendly. I'll see if I can get him a second time here. Oh, <laughs> oh we don't want him to go in there. Definitely don't want that. He's just really big and awkward. <laughs> it actually helps if he kind of wraps around my leg a little bit. Seems like that is kind of the trick with these big snakes. Kind of gives him a little something to hold on to. I was going to sneak him, sneak him right in here with Lucy. Let's see how Lucy takes this. <laughs> Lucy's even bigger to handle. She is a monster. All right, we got him in there. Whew. All right, so this is the setup here in this big six foot long enclosure. I have two snakes together and it seems like Lucy's pretty content. Sometimes she's really bucking Sunny off and you can see he's kind of up around the water dish over there. I have a big three gallon water dish over there and I use like a coconut husk substrate on the bottom. And I'll probably keep these guys together for about a week and a half to two weeks before I separate them again. Last time I actually saw them copulating, so I'm hoping this year I'll actually get the first eggs from Lucy. So I actually made the schedule and printed it out in Microsoft Excel. It's essentially the same schedule over and over. And I have my whole breeding operation here. Essentially what I do is I just move the males over to the females pretty easy. So for example, the Coral Glow, this funny thing is the Coral Glow male was actually off of food for quite a long time. As soon as I paired him up, he went back on food. You can see he's actually in three rodents here in the last feeding cycle. 
He's doing really big. <laughs> I've never seen this Corgolo look so big and fat. I've been really beefing these guys up, feeding them a lot of food. And essentially what you do is you just take the males and move them in with the females. This one I'm actually breeding my Coral Glow with this big huge lemon blast. Look at how big and beefy that girl is. She's really been eating some serious food. I'm hoping for some more Coral Glow pinstripes. Really beautiful combination. These are making some actually well you can actually get some Coral Glow lemon blasts but I, I can almost guarantee that these guys will definitely lay some eggs this year just based on how they both have been really eating. So here's a snake that is like the complete polar opposite. As soon as I paired this guy up, he went off of food instead of going on food. This is my fire pied male. And it's funny, he's just kept eating and eating and eating, getting really beefy, and then I paired him up and he just kind of stopped eating, which is crazy. Sometimes that'll happen, but I'd say in most cases, it'll actually be the opposite. And take a look at this big, huge pied girl. I actually had a really hard time getting her up to weight. And then I found out she really loves live rats, small live rats, and I've really been beefing her up with the live. The only thing she'll eat is live. And if I actually get some eggs from these, this is actually a fire pied male crossed with a pied female. So half the babies will be fire pieds, half will be straight pieds. Really beautiful looking snakes. So here's another kind of a weird combo. It's actually just the opposite that I wanted it. I actually started feeding all my snakes really heavy. And take a look at this, my albino pied male actually started eating really heavy five rodents in the last kind of feeding cycle. He's looking really big. He's looking so skinny that he almost had wrinkles in his skin. And all of a sudden, for whatever reason, he started really eating. The rodents looking really big now that he's in the breeding season. And it's funny, once you start pairing them up, they start fasting usually. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pair this guy up with this girl here, which she had some pretty good weight at the beginning. And now it seems like she's been fasting ever since I paired her up. So I'm thinking that I might not actually get any eggs from this girl. This is a bumblebee. So this one's actually my male bamboo lesser, just one year old. He's looking really good for one year. Definitely a breeding size. He's been eating really well. Nice and beefy. He's a blue-eyed leucistic, so everything that this guy breeds to will be half bamboo and half lesser coming out of that combo. I'm actually breeding him this year with this normal female. And this is kind of a really unusual looking female. It's got some really interesting colors and patterns. I'm thinking there might be something else in this normal because it doesn't look quite like your regular normal. I actually got some really interesting kind of dinker projects breeding to this girl. So I'm thinking there might be something in there that could be really interesting in the future. So here's another one of my hatchlings from last year that I'm pairing up. This is a scaleless head, 50% het caramel albino. You can see it has just a few scales missing from the top of the head. You actually breed two together and you get a completely scaleless snake. This has a 50% chance that it contains the caramel albino gene. And this is actually one of my big females. Look at how big this girl is, really super big. And she is actually 100% het caramel albino so actually you know what i'm hoping for i'm actually hoping for the scaleless head visual caramel albino <laughs> what she's doing in her water here she's a little bit freaked out <laughs> just look at how big and beefy she is and look at how small this little guy is compared to her so it's kind of incredible but i actually looked in here the last breeding cycle and they were actually stuck in a copulation it's pretty amazing how small of a male you can use for such a big female so this one is my male calico bamboo. Eight four rodents in the last cycle, doing really well. Getting, I'm sure he's looking really beefy. I'd say this is probably one of my favorite bamboo combos of all time. Look at how amazing this snake is. So beautiful. I have never produced a bamboo that is as impressive as this guy. Although I did produce one with pastel in it, which was pretty cool. 
but I think with with without the pastel, you get a lot of these whites. Really nice contrast between the whites and the bamboo. I'm pairing them up this year with a pastel. I'm shooting for the bamboo calico pastels again, which is a really awesome combo. All right, so this is probably my probably my most expensive snake in my whole collection that I actually bought. This is a male banana inchy clown. Look at how beautiful that guy is. Such a beautiful snake. I haven't had him for that long. I'm trying to get him to size to where he can actually breed. And he's looking really big and beefy, doing really well. He is a really awesome snake. I'm actually pairing him up with two clown females this year. And this clown is, she's kind of been one of my frustrations this year. She was eating really heavy at the beginning. And then as soon as I paired her up, she stopped eating and went on a fast right away. And she's getting almost to the point where she doesn't look like she'll lay some eggs. But I do have a lesser clown that I'm breeding with this male. And I'm sure that girl's going to lay. She is really eating a lot of rats, looking really, really big and beefy. This is such an awesome snake, though. <laughs> it doesn't even look real. It almost looks comical. It's a crazy looking snake. So I have two really exciting projects this year. One of them is the clown project. The other one is this desert ghost project. And take a look at this male pastel desert ghost. As a matter of fact, I had some stuff coming out of this guy that looked kind of inchy. People were kind of commenting. They said, hey, that lemon blast looks like it has some inchy. And I'm thinking this guy might have some inchy in the mix as well as the pastel, which is pretty cool. He's kind of going into shed just a little bit. But I want to keep him paired up for probably a week and a half. So going into shed is no problem at all. And I'm putting him with... Take a look at this. This is a beauty. This is my Desert Ghost female, which also has pastel and spider in the mix. It's a pastel spider Desert Ghost. Really beautiful combo. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost guaranteeing that this girl is going to lay eggs because she's been eating really good, looking really big and beefy. And I actually saw them in a copulation last breeding cycle. So I can almost guarantee I'm going to get some hatchlings for these. Definitely going to hold back another couple females from that pair. All right, so it is time for the question of the day. And Yosef Torres asks, I have a couple perfect infinity signs on one of my snakes. Is it possible to breed that into other snakes? And that is a very good question. As a matter of fact, I've seen some really interesting patterns in a lot of these morphs. It seems like in piebalds, sometimes you can get smiley faces. You can see infinities. As a matter of fact, I saw one guy with a snake that actually had his initials on the side of a snake. And I would say that is pretty much a random mutation. You really can't predict it. Although it's, if you're working with a specific line you may be more prone to actually get that kind of a mutation so for example if you took a couple pides that had smiley faces I'd say you have a pretty good likelihood of getting more pides with smiley faces working with those snakes although I don't think it's genetically transferred like you would think of a regular gene I don't think you can actually breed it to where you get 50% smiley faces in your offspring so that is pretty much it. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.